lies and the lying liars who tell them. Hello everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and today we are going to read this article. Uh, and it is titled, uh, Opinion, Here's the Reason People Tell Me They Want to Buy an AR-15, and it's simply ludicrous. I printed out so we can read through it. First off, uh, I'd just like to point it out and I'll try to post a screenshot here. When this article first popped into my Twitter feed, uh, it was titled, I own an AR-15, here's why you should not. Uh, apparently they decided that title was a little bit too honest and later edited it so by the time I clicked on it that the title had changed. So this article is by Michael Fanoni, Fanone, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, I'm pretty sure he might have testified about the January 6th riots back then. Can't quite remember, don't quote me on that part. Uh, but really all we need is this article to show that he is in fact a liar or an idiot, but likely not an idiot due to some of the correct things he says in this article, most likely just a liar. I will post a link to the article down below so you can read it and enjoy it for yourself, but here we go. No weapon has been more in the public eye of late than the AR-15, in large part because of its tragic role in some of the country's deadliest shootings. Okay, so right from the start, right, he sets it up incorrectly. Uh, rifles every year kill less people than hammers. More people are beaten to death with hands and feet than are killed by rifles, by all rifles. So right from the start, you can see where this is gonna go. The AR-15 has the dubious distinction of being America's most popular semi-automatic rifle. Let's talk about that dubious distinction. I looked that word up just to be sure I wasn't crazy, and the word means fraught uh, with uncertainty or doubt, doubtful or of questionable character, right? We would say someone has the dubious distinction of being a mob boss or the dubious distinction of writing an opinion piece for CNN. We would not say necessarily that a rifle has dubious, a dubious distinction. W what they're trying to, of course, slightly work in there slowly is to get you to doubt that the AR-15 is, is a valuable tool, which we're gonna get to in a bit. But even from the start, his language is this subtle attacking, well, it's a dubious distinction. Why, why should that be the most popular rifle? I'm more familiar with the gun than most people. I own one. Just one? What kind of rookie numbers are those? And one thing I know for sure is that this weapon doesn't belong in the hands of the average civilian. Okay, again, he, he's subtle with his terms to manipulate you. Average civilian, what does that mean? Is it, what about an above average civilian? Does it belong in their hands? Of course not. What he means is all civilians, right? And again, this is why I dislike this word civilian. What he means is people that aren't law enforcement, like he's a former law enforcement officer, or military, right? If you're not one of those two jobs, then you don't deserve the tools to save your life. You're just a civilian. You don't, of course, have rights, and your rights are determined by your job, and since you don't have one of the special government jobs, then of course you shouldn't have these special tools. I have multiple firearms for most of my life. I spent two decades in the Washington Metropolitan Police Department in a number of different roles, as a street cop walking the beat and on various special mission units. So he's, he's trying to set up his credentials here. He's trying to show you how much he knows so that he can then tell you you don't get rights. I'm also a card-carrying member of the National Rifle Association. And when I wasn't at my job doing police work, I worked part-time for several years in firearm sales, as well as training law enforcement officers, members of the military, and civilians. Again, notice how he lists civilians last, right? They're not important. You have the police, which you know, he's a former police officer, so back to blue, and then the members of the military, they train them how to do the pew pews, and then, you know, well, I mean, the civilians. I'd be really curious to see his numbers and as far as how many people he's trained and what he taught them. I purchased my different guns over the years for the same reason that you might purchase a flathead screwdriver along with a Phillips screwdriver. Each one serves a different purpose. As an avid hunter, I've got a gun that I use for turkey hunting, one that I use for waterfowl, and one that I use to hunt deer and larger game like elk. I mean, okay, that's, that's fine. This is one of the true things he says in here, right? People use different guns for different purposes. I agree. Um, notice again though, Guns are for hunting, right? That's where he's going back to. Well, I have different guns because I go hunt different game. And that's why I have different guns. But you know, nobody needs an AR-15, right? I purchased my AR-15 because I was assigned one as part of my police duties. But officers weren't allowed to take a department issued weapons home. Uh, now, again, he says department issued weapons. Now, I, <laughs> that's probably not true. More than likely he took his pistol home. Uh, I don't know of any police department that does that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. 
But also, what he means is they weren't allowed to take the patrol rifle home, right? Because the patrol rifle sticks with the car, typically. I felt it was my responsibility to become proficient with any weapon I'd been assigned to, so I bought one. And I've spent hundreds of hours training so I could properly use it. Okay, now, hey, credit where credit's due. Uh, I agree, if you're issued a weapon, you should know how to use it, so I guess I'm glad he bought one in that sense. However, he says he spent hundreds of hours training. The average police officer in this country gets about 16 hours of firearms training a year. Okay, that's average. Across the board, 16 hours of firearms training. That means with an instructor telling you what to do, helping you become a better shooter. 16 hours, that's a two day course. I just took a three day course recently. I'm more trained this year than most police officers in the nation. Okay, and remember, 16 hours is average. So I mean, some get less than that. Maybe some get a few more, maybe 24, right? But that, that's not happening. So he says hundreds of hours. So keep that in mind, 16 hours a year. And that's, not, of course, not all rifle, right? That's all pistol. So if you got rifle training every year for 16 hours, then I guess you can hit that 100 hours mark. More than likely, what he means is hundreds of hours practicing. Now, practicing is, of course, good, but he did not, I'm very doubtful, received hundreds of hours of training on the rifle. Furthermore, I teach a one-day rifle class. Lots of people teach one, two, three, five-day rifle classes. You can learn how to use a rifle in an eight-hour block of time. Shit, you can probably learn how to use it in four hours and be pretty proficient enough with it. Proficient enough to not do anything stupid and shoot intruders that come into your house. Rifles, particularly AR-15s, are incredibly easy to shoot, meaning to hit what you want with them, right? They're, they're not that difficult. And it does not take a lot of time on a rifle to be able to use it correctly and safely. So this idea that, oh, well, I had hundreds of hours of training because I was a police officer, so I know what I'm doing, but you're an incompetent civilian, that's, of course, a lie. <clears throat> He's going on to talk about his, his qualifications here. I've sold guns at big box retailers, and I've sold firearms at a small retail gun store. I'd be really curious to know what small retail gun store existed in the Washington, D.C. area, right? I mean, it was probably an outlier town, but again, in that part of America, I'd be real curious to know what, what store that was. Some gun buyers have been misled into thinking the AR-15 is somehow practical for self-defense. Okay, let's stop right there. Of course it's practical for self-defense. Uh, I have taken, I don't know, well over a dozen training courses now from very high-level guys. You can check it out on my website. I list every class I've taken. Even the best pistol shooters that I've taken classes from use rifles to protect their house. Why? Because again, it's easier to use. It's easier to hit what you want with it. And it's a more effective cartridge against bad guys than a handgun cartridge. So that's why we use rifles. They're better at stopping people from trying to kill you. That's why the police carry rifles. They're better at stopping people that are trying to kill them. I want the gun that the, we pray the police show up with. That would only make sense. So again, this whole idea that people have been misled into believing that they're, they're actually used for, for self-defense, that's a lie. And he probably knows it's a lie. He's gonna go on to explain it and it'll get more interesting. But frankly, it's the last gun I would recommend for that purpose. He doesn't mention what the gun is that he would recommend for that purpose. He just says AR-15 bat. I've pressed some customers about why they want an AR-15, but no one could ever come up with a legitimate justification for needing that particular weapon. Here's a legitimate justification. I want one. That's a perfectly legitimate justification. See, this is America, and in America, you don't need to explain to people why you deserve the right to self-defense. We believe that it's an inherent human right that you are endowed with by your creator. Therefore, I don't have to explain shit. Not only that, let's be honest, if, even if there was a reason, no reason would ever be good enough for these people except, hey, I work from the government and I'm here to oppress you, in which case they would say, well, of course, we need to give these people weapons. They're doing our jackbooting job. Point being, a legitimate reason isn't a thing, okay? That, that, that's not, we don't need a legitimate reason other than, hey, I want one, and that's good enough. Some members of the Tinfoil Hat Brigade have come up with a reply, we need these weapons because we want to be effective against the government if it becomes tyrannical. That's part of our Second Amendment right. Personally, I think that's ludicrous, but it has become an increasingly popular justification for purchasing a semi-automatic rifle. Has this idiot never, ever read a history book? Now, again, probably has. He's just lying, right? We just lost in Afghanistan, being there for 20 years, to some goat herders who had broken AKs and some cobbled together explosives. 
the greatest superpower in history lost to, again, some goat herders with broken semi-automatic rifles and cobbled together explosives. So don't tell me that they're somehow not effective for fighting the American military. Additionally, armed populaces do not succumb to tyranny. If you again read history, every population that's ever been attacked, abused, tyrannized was unarmed. And populations that were armed have been able to stave that off. It's one of the reasons we haven't fallen to tyranny here. And Afghanistan is an excellent example. When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in the 80s, they were armed to the teeth. Also, we supplied them with weapons and they were able to defeat the Soviets, right? Same thing when we took our turn in Afghanistan. Point being that armed nations don't succumb to tyranny. So I don't know why he calls it the tinfoil hat brigade because of course the second amendment exists so that the people are equipped to fight wars. The founding fathers didn't believe in standing armies, so which is correct, by the way, they were correct in that belief. Uh, and so the people should of course be equipped and ready to fight wars. So of course we want weapons that can fight wars. The AR-15 was given to law enforcement because more and more frequently police officers were encountering, encountering these types of weapons on the street and finding that they were outgunned. One example that springs to mind is the famous 1997 North Hollywood, California shootout at the Bank of America. Okay, yeah, that, that's been a thing since the 30s, right? Um, police officers have had started carrying uh, bigger guns, long guns, right? Shotguns, rifles, BARs, Thompson submachine guns, because they had to get in gunfights with bad guys and bad guys had good equipment. So that's part of the game. If, if, I guess if you're not willing to do that, then find a new job. I don't know what to tell you. I don't get to lose my rights because someone does something bad. That's just silly. In that incident, two individuals clad in body armor held up a bank in the Los Angeles neighborhood. Police who responded to the scene literally had to run to a nearby gun store to purchase more powerful weapons. I don't think they purchased them. I think they commandeered them. And they grabbed, guess, wait, wait for it, AR-15s. Because they were using 9mm pistols while the bad guys were armed with semi-automatic rifles okay now this, this might just be an editor thing but nine millimeter is nine space mm so again it might be the original author it might just be the editor who doesn't understand but i find that really interesting the standoff was one of the most infamous gun battles in american history with 11 officers wounded luckily none fatally and both robbery suspects shot dead while it's an extreme example it is in many ways the situation encountered by police officers all across this country police are simply outgunned against semi and fully automatic firearms. Number one, I'm pretty sure one of the Hollywood shooters uh, was done in through the head by a 357 Magnum, not some AR-15 that they had to go get from a local store, right? So that part isn't true. It is definitely true that these guys were getting pegged with nine millimeters and they had Kevlar on and so, you know, they were able to take it and just keep on trucking. He says police are outgunned by semi-automatic and fully automatic firearms. One, I'd be super curious to see the crimes where fully automatic firearms are used. Show me the last police gunfight with a fully automatic weapon. There are some, but however, there are not that many. We're talking maybe a handful every year. Uh, those numbers are extremely low. So that again, of course, is a lie. And semi-automatic firearms, pretty much all firearms are semi-automatic. With the exception, of course, like pump shotguns, you know, bolt action rifles, what say you, but all handguns are semi-automatic. Uh, that's how guns, again, pretty much work in the modern world. So this idea that if you have the same gun I have, me, me being a police officer, I have a semi-automatic handgun, you being a bad guy, you have a semi-automatic handgun, I'm outgunned all of a sudden because you have a semi-automatic handgun. Again, he's intentionally lying to you to just get you to do what he wants. The bullet that comes out of the barrel of an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle can easily penetrate the target. Okay, let's stop right there. That's actually not true. Uh, the FBI did extensive studies on this uh, and found that AR-15s and, and rifles tend to stop in the assailant and do not tend to overpenetrate as much as, wait for it, pistols, right? Because AR-15, you know, we're just talking about the two, 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 three round. They're going so fast, right, that they hit and they fragment and tumble into whatever it is that they hit, right? So they have a less tendency to go through bad guys. Can they still do that? Sure, of course. However, they have a less of a tendency to do that. They also have a less tendency to penetrate walls and structures for the same reasons, because they tumble and fragment. 
unlike, again, handgun bullets. So I'm just going to read that sentence again. The bullet that comes out of the barrel of an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle, again, notice he doesn't mention caliber there. Notice he just says, ah, oh, that style, can easily penetrate the target, the intruder, or whatever person you are using deadly force to defend yourself or others from. Again, lying, right? Because that's, that's not the true. And as a police officer for 20 years, he probably knows that. But it will also go through the wall behind that person and potentially through that room and into the next wall. That power and accuracy. <laughs> but it will also go through the wall behind that person and potentially through the room and into the next wall. That power and accuracy are useful for military purposes, which is obviously what they were designed for. But it's far more power that should be ever in the hands of the average civilian. Okay, again, absolutely lying, right? That, that's a verifiable lie. The FBI has done extensive studies on this. It's just a lie, straight up. The power and accuracy. Uh, notice how he brings accuracy in here when it has nothing to do with what he's talking about. The power, I'm assuming again he means the bullet, you know, ripping through seven city blocks because that's what ARs do. Um, and accuracy, but accuracy has nothing to do with it. He just throws that in there for military purposes. What are, what are military purposes? Uh, shooting bad guys. What are self-defense purposes? Um, is it, oh, shooting bad guys. There we go. Again, he uses this term, average civilian. Well, what is, again, above average civilian, below average, what does that mean? What it means is people who don't have the special government job. The bullet fired by the AR-15 is capable of defeating the average police officer's body armor like a knife slicing through butter. I really like that dramatic uh, example of a knife slicing through butter. Is it cold butter? Because cold butter is kind of difficult. Point being, uh, right, most police, police officers wear soft armor and rifle rounds uh, penetrate soft armor because soft armor is, you know, what, level 3A. And of course, rifles gonna go through that. That's, that's just physics. SWAT teams and some of the more specialized units typically are equipped with level four Kevlar or steel plated armor. Okay, so that's super interesting. Uh, level four Kevlar. I have no, what, what is level four Kevlar? That's not a thing. We use ceramic for level four plates or there's maybe some kind of cool hybrids now, but ceramic, right? Uh, level four steel plate. Again, what is, what is, what is that? The, you, you're not gonna be able to find a steel plate that's level four armor. You have to, even AR 500 armor uses ceramic plates for the level four armor because steel plated level four armor isn't a thing. Again, he's lying to you or he's an idiot. I don't know how you can be a police officer for 20 years and not understand basic armor level distinctions. At least he gets the level four correct. Which would maybe stop, which would stop maybe two or three direct hits, but eventually our body armor breaks down after being hit with multiple rounds. Whew, okay. So if it's steel armor, right? We can get an AR 500 armor plate here and we can ding, 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 ding all we want on that sucker. Now you might have some spall issues or whatever, but that bullet is not going through that plate anytime soon. Uh, there are tons of armor tests, right? Uh, you can watch level four armor tests where they are spitting like a full mag into level four ceramic plates and it's not penetrating. Also, are you just gonna stand there and let someone shoot you multiple times? That's just silly. If you let someone stand there where they dump an entire mag into your chest, well, I'm sorry, but you probably are in the wrong line of work. So again, he's doing everything he can here to make it as scary as possible by mm, lying to you. A person wielding an AR-15 has a range beyond 300 yards. That part's true, actually, so. For an officer armed with a nine millimeter pistol, again, nine, it's nine space MM, I don't understand. Hitting a target beyond 50 yards is going to be difficult. That's because they suck at shooting, even for the most accomplished marksmen. Okay, I'm not saying a, a, a shot beyond 50 yards is easy, okay? I would say that's when it starts to get good, right? But if you can't hit an eight inch circle at 50 yards, you know, maybe find a new job. That's just a random thought here. Even for an accomplished marksman. Accomplished marksman, like let's say uh, Jerry Michalek, he's a pretty accomplished marksman. Jerry Michalek can shoot a snub nosed revolver upside down with his pinky and ding steel at 200 yards. Okay, I'm not making that up. I've, I've seen the video, it's actually pretty cool. Point being, that for an accomplished marksman, they can of course hit beyond 50 yards. That, that, that's, that's absolutely a thing. But again, he's trying to make it sound as scary. Like pistols are basically useless and don't do anything. And all these people now have AR-15s and they're just absolute murder machines. And so that's what he's trying to do. 
Lying is an effective tool if you just do it the whole article. A bullet fired by an AR-15 travels at three times the velocity as one fired by a 9mm handgun. Again, that's, that's actually mostly true. And magazines that can feed dozens of rounds into the weapon in the space of minutes clearly were meant for use only on the battlefield. <laughs> okay, so that's just absolutely overly dramatic, right? And has nothing to do with anything. Notice he says dozens of rounds. A mag holds 28, okay? So I guess that's, that's over two dozen rounds. Uh, a pistol magazine holds, you know, 15, 17 rounds. So that's, that's more than halfway there, depending on how you're gonna count. Um, so I'm not, and mag swap, if you can't change a mag in a couple seconds, well then I guess, again, wrong line of work. Point being, he says minutes. It can feed dozens of rounds in minutes. I mean, I'm surprised he didn't go for like the seconds or milliseconds there because, again, it's, just, it's not that intimidating even in this dramatic retelling. The prevalence of these weapons means police are sometimes overmatched, as we saw with the mass shooting in Uvala, I don't know how to pronounce the city, U U Uvala, Texas, I don't know how to say that, last month. In a situation where you have small children near the shooter, you want to remove the threat as quickly as possible. Okay, we're gonna come back to the police being overmatched part in a minute, okay? Uh, in a situation where you have small children near the shooter, you want the shooter removed as soon as possible. So if the shooter's just not around small, like, again, that's a stupid sentence. Of course you want the shooter removed as soon as possible. That's what all active shooter training has revolved around for the last 20 some years. You go in, you find the bad guy, you shoot the bad guy. That's pretty simple and straightforward. What gun they have is irrelevant because the border patrol agent who actually did shoot the bad guy did it with a shotgun, which is probably one of the worst weapons you could have had in that situation, but he got it done. I have no doubt that police in Uvalada wish they had weapons as powerful as the one carried by the shooter who snuffed out the lives of victims in that school but a far better outcome would have been if the shooter didn't have an AR-15 in the first place. Again, absolutely a lie. The police had armor and AR-15s stood outside for last time I saw it was an hour and 40 minutes, something like that. Um, I, I thought the original estimate was 40 minutes, but let's just go at least 40 minutes standing outside while they can hear the gunshots, kids are calling 911. They have rifles, they have body armor, probably level four plates, standing around doing nothing. So he makes it sound like it was an equipment issue. Oh, the police couldn't go in there because they were outgunned because it was an equipment issue. They didn't have as good a guns as the bad guy had. Again, that's an absolutely verifiable lie. They had the equipment, they had the correct training, they just did nothing because they're cowards who should never hold the badge again in their lives. The fact that he brings up the Texas shooting is absolutely disgusting because he's lying to you about what happened and saying because these cowards couldn't do their job even though they had the AR-15, the shooter had an AR-15 and they were just too scared and, and that's really not their fault. It would have just been better if nobody had that gun. There are more AR-15s in America, I think at this point, probably than there are people. So good luck getting those out of the hands of everybody. Now, I'm no longer in the police force. Thank God for that. My AR-15 collects dust in my safe. Rifle ranges that permit the type of training required to use this weapon system effectively are few and far between, and the cost of ammunition exceeding a dollar per round is more than this guy can afford. <laughs> okay, first of all, I like how he makes it sound like the training is super complicated. Like you can't just go to a range and plank with an AR, which a lot of people do. It's not my bag, but a lot of people do that, right? Also, he doesn't mention that, you know, you could, uh, I don't know, gee, dry fire, and you could do that if you want to work on web manipulations and, you know, reloads, tack reloads, malfunction clearances, whatever. So again, he's lying to you. He's making it sound like it's a super complicated system and it's a weapon system. You notice how he brings that term out there, weapon system? Like, like, bro, it's a rifle. It takes a magazine. You run the bolt and you can party. Like, I don't, you, this is not complicated. But he wants to make it sound as complicated and complex as possible for you to, you to understand you don't have the special secret knowledge. You don't have the super super secret knowledge that I have. So you can't possibly understand how to use the weapon. Also, I like his, his attempt at, at trying to relate to the plebs, right? He's like, well, you know, I can't afford more than a dollar a round. So first of all, bullets aren't that expensive right now. They are more expensive than they should be, uh, but they're not a dollar a round. And he kept lying, this is verifiably lying. I no longer need it, but neither, to be honest, do most people flocking to gun stores to buy one. Well, so what? So what if you don't need it? So what if you don't have a justification? If you want it, you can buy it. What's the problem? I don't understand. If, if good people have guns, 
that actually is a disincentive to bad people doing bad things. So what's his point? Banning these powerful weapons from the civilian marketplace is a no-brainer, as are universal background checks. Neither move is going to solve all the gun problems we have, but it would be a start. So, again, notice we want to ban it from civilian hands. I mean, not, not the military and the police. Obviously, they need these guns because, you know, but civilians, incompetent, idiot, untrained civilians, they shouldn't have it because they don't have special government jobs. He also throws in the universal background check thing, which is, which is cute, right? Like, what does that really have to do with what he's been saying up to this point? Because he's just pushing for all gun control, so he's just trying to stuff some things in there. I'm surprised he didn't go for the red flag laws, too. And then, this is my favorite, that neither move is going to solve all the gun problems we have. Then why are we doing it? But it would be a start. All the gun control laws are a start. There is no end game for them, except, of course, complete and total confiscation and no guns in any civilian hands at all, right? That's, that's of course, their ultimate goal. But if they always say it, well, it would be a start. Let's ban AR-15s and have red flag laws and ban ammunition sales and allow us to sue gun manufacturers and, you know, create a national gun registry. That would be a good start. Like, it's always a start. It's never enough. Well, what's the end? Like we know, the end, of course, is getting rid of all guns forever. Except, of course, unless you have a special government job. And outlawing these AR-15s would not require confiscating them from people who already have them. When I first read that, I thought, oh, oh, well, oh, that's so nice of you. Once you've made these weapons illegal, anyone found with one would be subject to arrest, since possession of these weapons should be a crime. <laughs> so we'll just make them illegal. And then as these people deal with police officers, they're going to get arrested when we find out they have an AR-15. That'll solve it. If you think that most AR-15 owners are just going to hand them over, I don't think you quite understand this country. I think it's likely you would see a lot of people opting to turn them in. I just, I, I, don't, I don't know where you're getting that from, bro. I don't. Again, you're just saying he's lying to try to convince you, no, we should just ban him, people will turn him in, and then it'll be all good. When in reality, of course, gun violence will spike through the roof because they're going to send men with guns to take your guns. If banning them outright seems too, like too extreme a solution to be politically palatable or morally correct. Here's another option. Reclassify semi-automatic rifles as Class 3 firearms. Oh, that, this is going to get fun. That would mean that someone wanting to purchase an AR-15 would have to go through a background check, fingerprinting, and a review by an official from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, a process that could take anywhere from 12 to 16 months. And since Class 3 weapons can't be purchased by anyone younger than 21, it would solve the issue of emotionally unstable 18-year-olds buying them. But those same emotionally unstable 18-year-olds can sign up for the military and be a tank gunner? fire a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Like what, what, what is, see, he's just swiping all, anyone under 21, you're emotionally unstable and stupid and don't deserve to have rights. If 18 year olds aren't adults, then we can have that discussion. But once you're an adult, you know, you have the right to do all the things that adults do. I also like that his argument here is, look, if we can't just take him away and make it illegal, let's at least infringe on people's rights as much as we can by making him deal with the ATF more. A class three firearm reclassification would also make those who are approved to purchase these weapons subject to annual check that they are complying with federal regulations regarding secure storage of the firearm and to confirm their licensing and other paperwork is up to date. All of these hoops and hurdles are sure to reduce the civilian demand for these weapons. As I was cutting this together, I noticed that I miss an important point here, which is that he talks about class three firearms and he conflates some terms. So if you don't know what a class three firearms is, that's actually a reference to an FFL type license. Uh, if someone ever sells you a silencer or an SBR or something like that, something that's regulated by the NFA, that's a, they have a class three license. So what he's saying is we should reclassify AR-15s to be class three, like silencers, SBRs, short barreled shotguns, stuff like that. So, you know, you have to go through the $200 tax stamp process. You have to get fingerprinted. You have to send your application to the ATF. It's reviewed by an ATF official, like he says here, which just means, you know, 
some paper pusher looks at your thing and, and approves it. Uh, and then of course you get your can out of jail months later. If you've never bought a silencer, you're not familiar with that process, it's kind of a pain. However, he then conflates all of that stuff with what the FFL dealer has to do, which is annual inspections and checks and whatever, which again, uh, I don't actually know how much that actually happens in reality and the ATF actually comes to these places and checks them out. As far as I know, next to never. However, he's conflating things. He's basically saying, we, and he's either lying or an idiot, because if you've ever bought a silencer, you know that you fill up the stupid paperwork, you send it in, and then you get your silencer, and that's it. That's the end of the deal. But if you're a dealer, you have some extra regulations and whatever where the ATF can come visit, and you do have to make sure that you know, yeah, we store these things safely and whatever. So he's conflating those. Like you, the civilian, should have both requirements. You know, you should have all the fingerprint stuff, and the ATF should just be able to come into your house anytime to make sure that it's stored safely and, and whatever. So he conflates all these terms together and makes up a reality which doesn't exist and says that's how we should classify AR-15s. So again, either lying or an idiot. So again, he's just, too, he's just being too honest. Listen, if we just you know, lock it down and really, really choke them with regulation, then that will help crush people's desire and will to live. Right now, I find this ironic, of course, because silencers are highly regulated. However, you know, those are hitting record sales these days. I can't overstate how dangerous it is to have semi-automatic weapons like the AR-15 in the hands of civilians. Again, he's using that civilian word. It's dangerous because you don't have the special government job. You don't have the special super secret knowledge training that I have. So it's dangerous for you. That's, again, not true. Uh, but again, he needs to lie to you and beat you up and make you understand that you're an idiot and that he is the God from on high who, of course, is allowed to grant you what rights you may or may not have. And he's going to do that, of course, through fear. That, that's the primary tactic for gun control advocates. Fear and lies. And they're going to combine those two and bludgeon you to death with both of them in order to get you to comply. And for people who don't know, well, of course, it works. Our public officials have it within their power to help make it harder for people who have these weapons to get them. So again, what he's saying is you. Our public officials should make it harder for you to get them because that's who we need to take guns from, you. A police officer should never have to worry about being outgunned by the bad guy they're protecting the public against. If you're afraid of being outgunned by a bad guy, uh, carry a better gun, wear level four plates, uh, maybe you're in the wrong line of work. I don't know, there's some other things you could do there. But notice then that he is, at the end, he's bludgeoning you, he's beating you up, and then he's saying, no, look, I'm here to protect you, just like those police in Texas did when they arrested the parents who were trying to go in to save their kids. They did their duty to preserve and protect the public. I'm gonna do that job. And that's why you shouldn't have an AR-15. Do brave deeds and endure.